Of course, the Rafa crossing that I mentioned is a spot. It's an eight mile fence. On one side, it's millions of people who are trapped in Gaza tonight. On the other side is Egypt's Sinai Desert, it is now the only way in for food, for water, for supplies. It's the only way out for people who do have another passport to get them to another country. And I'm joined now by a senior advisor to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the former Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom, Mark Regev. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for being here. Is Israel committed to making sure that the Rafah crossing stays open so these, these crossings can continue? We are indeed, and we're hopeful that we'll see more people uh, be leaving in the coming days. Uh, uh, obviously, we're talking first and foremost about the na nationals with uh, two passports. Uh, sorry. The dual nationals who have a foreign passport and of course uh, now that the Egyptians have established a field hospital on the rougher side uh, on the Egyptian side of the rougher crossing we're hopeful that people who need that that hospital attention need health care can go there too we're hopeful that other countries will be augmenting the Egyptians and we'll see further field hospitals there on the Egyptian side of the crossing and our understanding was that Americans, in large part, I know there are a few people who got through today, doctors, will be crossing on Thursday. Can you explain why that is? And is that your understanding as well, that Americans, most of them out of Gaza, will be allowed to leave on Thursday? From our point of view, this should have been done uh, uh, weeks ago, at the very beginning of the conflict. I remember this issue was first raised by Secretary Blinken when he was here on his first visit, and that was just a few days after the conflict had started. Uh, so from our point of view, this was something that we wanted to happen a while ago. It took us a while to get make this happen, primarily because Hamas caused a lot of problems. Only because of pressure on Hamas, I think, have they agreed now to, to for the exit of the, the people with the foreign passports. Well, Israel, of course, was part of those negotiations as well. There were some concerns over when uh, Israeli airstrikes and where they were hitting. But I do want to ask you, because the IDF confirmed today that the Jabalia refugee camp has been hit for a second time, of course, that comes after yesterday. The IDF said a strike there killed a Hamas commander, but we also know it, it killed civilians as well. Why did Israel strike again here? And do you know how many civilians have been killed in this area as a result of these strikes yesterday and today? So we know we've taken out a senior Hamas commander who was directly involved in the massacre of October 7th. Uh, as you will recall, there were rapes, there were beheadings, there were people burnt alive. Uh, birds so badly, we uh, until today we've got 130 bodies that we can't uh, recognize who they are. They're, they're just ashes. Uh, and uh, anyone who was involved, especially a commander of the operation, we have a duty to find them and to bring them to justice. And we have meted out very, very speedy justice with this this individual. But to the question of why did Israel strike a second time today, and do you have a, an estimate of how many civilians? were killed as a result of these strikes yesterday and today? So I can't tell you, I know that we've hit senior Hamas commanders and we've hit many Hamas uh, terrorists. That's our goal. In the Jabalia camp, subterranean, your pictures are only so showing what's above ground for obvious reasons. But underneath there, you have a spider web of, uh, of tunnels, uh, uh, of bunkers, of uh, uh, fortifications, an underground city which Hamas has built over the years, of course, stealing the cement and the electricity and so forth from the people of Gaza. And in building those fortifications, that's an integral part of their military machine. And we are about to destroy that military machine. If we need to attack it again, we'll attack it again. OK, but you're not acknowledging how many. I assume Israel does have an estimate of how many civilians were killed. I assume you have an estimate of how many civilians are there when you make a calculus on when to strike. Tell me if that's wrong. But when you decide on striking targets that you say are military targets, but are also where civilians are. I mean, how many civilian deaths does Israel believe are acceptable in an airstrike if it is a military target? So obviously we try to keep any collateral damage to a minimum, as minimum as possible. And the advantage of this particular location is that it has been largely, not totally, but largely evacuated because we were telling people there two weeks ago longer that they should evacuate that area, that there will be fighting. And that whole area around Gaza City, including the refugee camp, uh, about 800,000 people have moved to the south as we requested and more so in the, uh, in the last few days as the ground operation started. And so we think there, of course, are civilians still in the area. We're making a, a great effort to, to distinguish between them and Hamas. But the good news is that the, the huge civilian population 
that used to be there ha has vacated. But do you know how many were killed? I can't tell you exactly because I don't know. What uh, about an uh, of estimate? Of course, the, the numbers that come out from the Hamas-controlled Ministry of Health are, are of course, uh, uh, high, but we don't believe them. So and what number do you If you look at those statistics, we've never hit a single uh, terrorist. Uh, we only hit civilians. That's, of course, obviously mendacious. You don't believe their number. I obviously understand why it's controlled by Hamas that's putting out these figures. But what number? I haven't heard a number from, from Israel. What number do we, you We don't have it. We can't give you a precise number, and I, I don't want to give a number ir irresponsibly. I can say the following. Most of the civilians left that location before we struck. I'm not denying there are a few there. But we've hit a primary Hamas target. We've taken out a Hamas leader. We've taken out many, many Hamas fighters. Uh, that was the goal of our operation. And, and, and casualties, if there were civilian casualties, surely that has to be based on Hamas because the, the Geneva Convention is clear. Uh, if, if, if a combatant turns a civilian area into a war zone, in other words, if he's placed his military machine inside a civilian neighborhood, he has in fact endangered the civilians because according to the Geneva Convention, uh, the, the, the additional protocol, uh, Article 13. I understand. By doing the... so, he's made it a legitimate target. Now, even though we have a legal right to do so, under the laws of war, to attack a legitimate Hamas target, we still made an effort, told all the civilians, please vacate the, the, the location. And I'm happy to tell you that the overwhelming majority of, of, of Gaza civilians in that location have, in fact, left. Yeah. The number of civilians left there is small. Ambassador we don't want to hurt them. I will say, Ambassador, a lot of them feel like they don't have places to go, certainly it's not safe places. But as far as what Israel is doing on the ground in Gaza, the military said earlier today that Israeli ground forces, they have advanced to the gates of Gaza City. Are Israeli forces inside Gaza City right now? I can't answer that question. We're not giving those sort of operational details out publicly for obvious reasons, because Hamas is watching also CNN and they want any information they can about where our forces are and what operations are upcoming. We won't get that sort of information out, other than to say uh, we are committed to the mission. We will destroy Hamas's military machine. We'll do everything we can to get our hostages out. And we will push this through to its end. And the end is an end of Hamas rule in Gaza and the destruction of the Hamas military machine. We will not allow, Caitlin, we simply will not allow again the sort of massacre that they perpetrated against us on October 7th. Never again. And we'll prevent that from happening by destroying their capacity, their capability to inflict that sort of massacre upon our people. It's very clear that Israeli, for I mean, your own military is saying that they are on the ground there. We've seen them going in into Gaza in this second phase of this campaign. Can you explain why Israel is hesitant or just is, is not is refusing to call it a ground invasion? Well, we've obviously got ground forces uh, inside the Gaza Strip. I think what we call it is immaterial. Uh, I, if you want to call it an invasion, you can call it what you want. But we are there on the ground to take on Hamas, to defeat Hamas, to end the rule of Hamas in Gaza. And ultimately, our objective is, of course, good for Israel, because we're going to free the people of southern Israel from this constant threat of this, this ISIS-type terrorist organization. But at the same time, I ultimately believe that it's good for the people of Gaza too, who deserve better. I mean, for 16 years, Hamas has ruled Gaza, and what have they bought for the people of Gaza? Uh, only suffering, pain, and impoverishment. Uh, the people of Gaza deserve better, surely. Ambassador Mark Regev, thank you for your time tonight.